It was a time when reason challenged tradition, and the spirit of skepticism challenged authority. At the heart of this intellectual revolution stood one man, whose wit and wisdom would come to define an age, François-Marie Arouet, better known as Voltaire. François-Marie Arouet was born in Paris, the youngest of the five children of François Arouet, a lawyer who was a minor treasury official, and his wife, Marie Marguerite Daumert, whose family was on the lowest rank of the French nobility. Born in 1694 into a noble family, Voltaire's early years were marked by a thirst for knowledge and a rebellious spirit that clashed with the conventions of his time. By the time he left school, Voltaire had decided he wanted to be a writer, against the wishes of his father, who wanted him to become a lawyer. Voltaire, pretending to work in Paris as an assistant to a notary, spent much of his time writing poetry. When his father found out, he sent Voltaire to study law, this time in Cannes, Normandy. But the young man continued to write, producing essays and historical studies. Voltaire's wit made him popular among some of the aristocratic families with whom he mixed. In 1713, his father obtained a job for him as a secretary to the new French ambassador in the Netherlands, the Marquis de Chateauneuf, the brother of Voltaire's godfather. At The Hague, Voltaire fell in love with a French Protestant refugee named Catherine Olympe Dunoyer, known as Pimpette. Their affair, considered scandalous, was discovered by de Chateauneuf and Voltaire was forced to return to France by the end of the year. Arouet adopted the name Voltaire in 1718, following his incarceration at the Bastille. Its origin is unclear. It is an anagram of Arouet L.I., the Latinized spelling of his surname, Arouet, and the initial letters of Le Jeune, the Young. According to a family tradition among the descendants of his sister, he was known as Le Petit Volontaire, determined little thing, as a child, and he resurrected a variant of the name in his adult life, the name also reverses the syllables of Ervault, his family's hometown in the Poitou region. Despite pressure to pursue a career in law, Voltaire followed his passion for writing, penning plays, poetry, and essays that challenged the status quo. Voltaire's next play, Artemeyer, set in ancient Macedonia, opened on February 15, 1720. It was a flop and only fragments of the text survived. He instead turned to an epic poem about Henry IV of France that he had begun in early 1717. Denied a license to publish, in August 1722 Voltaire headed north to find a publisher outside France. On the journey, he was accompanied by his mistress, Marie Marguerite de Rupelmond, a young widow. At Brussels, Voltaire and Rousseau met up for a few days, before Voltaire and his mistress continued northwards. A publisher was eventually secured in the Hague.In the Netherlands, Voltaire was struck and impressed by the openness and tolerance of Dutch society. On his return to France, he secured a second publisher in Rouen, who agreed to publish La Henriade clandestinely after Voltaire's recovery from a month-long smallpox infection in November 1723, the first copies were smuggled into Paris and distributed. While the poem was an instant success, Voltaire's new play, Mariam, was a failure when it first opened in March 1724. Heavily reworked, it opened at the Comédie Française in April 1725 to a much improved reception. It was among the entertainments provided at the wedding of Louis XV and Marie Leskinska in September 1725. His sharp wit and incisive critiques caught the attention of the elite but also drew the ire of the authorities, leading to his first of many brushes with censorship and exile. Undeterred by adversity, Voltaire embarked on a journey across Europe, where he encountered the leading thinkers and luminaries of his time. In early 1726, 
The aristocratic Chevalier de Rohan Chabot taunted Voltaire about his change of name, and Voltaire retorted that his name would win the esteem of the world, while Rohan would sully his own. The furious Rohan arranged for his thugs to beat up Voltaire a few days later. Seeking redress, Voltaire challenged Rohan to a duel, but the powerful Rohan family arranged for Voltaire to be arrested and imprisoned without trial in the Bastille on April 17, 1726. Fearing indefinite imprisonment, Voltaire asked to be exiled to England as an alternative punishment, which the French authorities accepted. On May 2, he was escorted from the Bastille to Calais and embarked for Britain. In England, Voltaire lived largely in Wandsworth, with acquaintances including Everard Falconer from December 1727 to June 1728 he lodged at Maiden Lane, Covent Garden, now commemorated by a plaque, to be nearer to his British publisher. Voltaire circulated throughout English high society, meeting Alexander Pope, John Gay, Jonathan Swift, Lady Mary Wortley Montague, Sarah, Duchess of Marlborough, and many other members of the nobility and royalty. Voltaire's exile in Great Britain greatly influenced his thinking. He was intrigued by Britain's constitutional monarchy in contrast to French absolutism, and by the country's greater freedom of speech and religion. He was influenced by the writers of the time, and developed an interest in English literature, especially Shakespeare, who was still little known in continental Europe, despite pointing out Shakespeare's deviations from neoclassical standards, Voltaire saw him as an example for French drama, which, though more polished, lacked on-stage action. Later, however, as Shakespeare's influence began growing in France, Voltaire tried to set a contrary example with his own plays, decrying what he considered Shakespeare's barbarities. Voltaire may have been present at the funeral of Isaac Newton, and met Newton's niece Catherine Condit. In 1727, Voltaire published two essays in English, upon the civil wars of France, extracted from curious manuscripts and upon epic poetry of the European nations, from Homer down to Milton that he also published a letter about the Quakers after attending one of their services. After two and a half years in exile, Voltaire returned to France, and after a few months in Dieppe, the authorities permitted him to return to Paris. At a dinner, French mathematician Charles-Marie de la Condamine proposed buying up the lottery that was organized by the French government to pay off its debts, and Voltaire joined the consortium, earning perhaps a million livres. He invested the money cleverly and on this basis managed to convince the court of finances of his responsible conduct, allowing him to take control of a trust fund inherited from his father. He was now indisputably rich. Many of Voltaire's prose works and romances, usually composed as pamphlets, were written as polemics. Candide attacks the passivity inspired by Leibniz's philosophy of optimism through the character Pangloss's frequent refrain that circumstances are the best of all possible worlds. Lhomme ux carant ecus, the man of forty pieces of silver, addresses social and political ways of the time, Zadig and others, the received forms of moral and metaphysical orthodoxy, and some were written to deride the Bible. In these works, Voltaire's ironic style, free of exaggeration, is apparent, particularly the restraint and simplicity of the verbal treatment, Candide in particular is the best example of his style. Voltaire also has, in common with Jonathan Swift, the distinction of paving the way for science fiction's philosophical irony, particularly in his Micromegas and the vignette Plato's Dream. In general, his criticism and miscellaneous writing show a similar style to Voltaire's other works. Almost all of his more substantive works, whether in verse or prose, are preceded by prefaces of one sort or another, which are models of his caustic yet conversational tone. In a vast variety of nondescript pamphlets and writings, he displays his skills at journalism. 
In pure literary criticism his principal work is the Commentaire sur Corneille, although he wrote many more similar works, sometimes, as in his Life and Notices of Molière, independently and sometimes as part of his siècles. Voltaire's first major philosophical work in his battle against Ellen Fame was the Traite sur la Tolerance, Treatise on Tolerance, exposing the Kala affair, along with the tolerance exercised by other faiths and in other eras, for example, by the Jews, the Romans, the Greeks and the Chinese. Then, in his Dictionnaire Philosophique, containing such articles as Abraham, Genesis, Church Council, he wrote about what he perceived as the human origins of dogmas and beliefs, as well as in human behavior of religious and political institutions in shedding blood over the quarrels of competing sections. Amongst other targets, Voltaire criticized France's colonial policy in North America, dismissing the vast territory of New France as a few acres of snow. Like other key Enlightenment thinkers, Voltaire was a deist. He challenged orthodoxy by asking, what is faith? Is it to believe that which is evident? No. It is perfectly evident to my mind that there exists a necessary, eternal, supreme, and intelligent being. This is no matter of faith, but of reason. In a 1763 essay, Voltaire supported the toleration of other religions and ethnicities, it does not require great art, or magnificently trained eloquence, to prove that Christians should tolerate each other. I, however, am going further, I say that we should regard all men as our brothers. What? The Turk my brother? The Chinaman my brother? The Jew? The Siam? Yes, without doubt, are we not all children of the same father and creatures of the same God? Historians have described Voltaire's description of the history of Christianity as propagandistic. His Dictionnaire Philosophique is responsible for the myth that the early church had 50 gospels before settling on the standard canonical for as well as propagating the myth that the canon of the New Testament was decided at the First Council of Nicaea. Voltaire is partially responsible for the misattribution of the expression credo quia absurdum to the church fathers. Furthermore, despite the death of Hypatia being the result of finding herself in the crossfires of a mob, likely Christian, during a political feud in 4th century Alexandria, Voltaire promoted the theory that she was stripped naked and murdered by the minions of the Bishop Cyril of Alexandria, concluding by stating that, when one finds a beautiful woman completely naked, it is not for the purpose of massacring her. Voltaire meant for this argument to bolster one of his anti-Catholic tracts. In a letter to Frederick the Great, dated January 5, 1767, he wrote about Christianity. However, Voltaire also acknowledged the self-sacrifice of Christians. He wrote, Perhaps there is nothing greater on earth than the sacrifice of youth and beauty, often of high birth, made by the gentle sex in order to work in hospitals for the relief of human misery, the sight of which is so revolting to our delicacy. Peoples separated from the Roman religion have imitated but imperfectly so generous a charity. Yet, according to Daniel Rops, Voltaire's hatred of religion increased with the passage of years. The attack, launched at first against clericalism and theocracy, ended in a furious assault upon Holy Scripture, the dogmas of the Church, and even upon the person of Jesus Christ himself, who, he, depicted now as a degenerate. Voltaire's reasoning may be summed up in his well-known saying, those who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. In February 1778, Voltaire returned to Paris for the first time in over 25 years, partly to see the opening of his latest tragedy, Irene. The five-day journey was too much for the 83-year-old, and he believed he was about to die on February 28, writing, I die adoring God, loving my friends, not hating my enemies, and detesting superstition. However, he recovered, and in March he saw a performance of Irene, 
where he was treated by the audience as a returning hero. He soon became ill again and died on May 30, 1778. The accounts of his deathbed have been numerous and varying, and it has not been possible to establish the details of what precisely occurred. His enemies related that he repented and accepted the last rites from a Catholic priest, or that he died in agony of body and soul, while his adherents told of his defiance to his last breath. According to one story of his last words, when the priest urged him to renounce Satan, he replied, this is no time to make new enemies. However, this appears to have originated from a joke in a Massachusetts newspaper in 1856, and was only attributed to Voltaire in the 1970s. Because of his well-known criticism of the church, which he had refused to retract before his death, Voltaire was denied a Christian burial in Paris, but friends and relations managed to bury his body secretly at the Abbey of Celliers, F.R., in Champagne, where Marie-Louise's brother was Abbé. His heart and brain were embalmed separately. On July 11, 1791, the National Assembly of France, regarding Voltaire as a forerunner of the French Revolution, had his remains brought back to Paris and enshrined in the Pantheon. An estimated million people attended the procession, which stretched throughout Paris. There was an elaborate ceremony, including music composed for the event by André Gretry. Voltaire's influence extended far beyond his own lifetime, shaping the course of history and inspiring generations of thinkers and activists. For in the footsteps of Voltaire, we find not only a beacon of enlightenment but a timeless reminder that the pursuit of truth and freedom is a journey we must all embark upon, for the betterment of humanity and the world we inhabit.